Please join us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. Our cups truly do runneth over. We have these prayers before you at this time, Father, that are unspoken. You know every heart, every need, every wish, every dream, every concern. And we thank you for not only hearing these prayers, but we thank you for answering them in perfect season. And also we pray before you this day, Father, for Jody, June, Dana, Shane, Heather, Rachel, Caleb, Isaiah, <coughs> Stacy, Harley, Jacob, Ross, Becca, and all those on YouTube. We ask, dear Lord, that you lead, that you guide, that you direct, that you touch in Yeshua's precious holy name. And as always, Father, we pray for all those who have come and gone from our chapel, that you watch over them. Wherever they are, whatever they are doing, we pray, dear Lord, they are spending time in thy word and doing thy word and obeying thy commandments. And we pray always, Father, for Israel and for our nation, for thy kingdom to come, for thy will to be done on this earth as it is in heaven, to which we say, Come, Lord, come. And as always, Father, we pray for those first responders. Every day they're on the front lines do, doing thy will, helping thy children. And we pray for our military who are in arm's way or who are about to go into arm's way for their safety and speedy return home. And as always, Father, we pray for the lost, those that do not have an opportunity this day to receive thy truth. Now, Father, I pray that you open up our eyes that we may see. I pray that you open up our ears that we may hear thy words as it is written, as it will be you that speaks to us this day. In Yeshua's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, getting back and finishing from Pentecost, honoring that last week. We're getting back into the book of Revelation today. Uh, a question I'd like to put out very quickly. Why is it so important, do you think, to study God's Word at a deeper level? What's, what's I mean, there's nothing wrong in just reading the Word of God. But we're told to study the Word of God, study to show thyself approved. Well, why is it so important to go to that level? So Satan can't deceive us. Yeah, he's the big deceiver. And, and he is a scripture lawyer. So coming out the gate, we know that the powers that be, uh, the principalities, as the Word says, there's people and entities out there that want to deceive us. And the main thing, what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with people's souls. So it's highly important. I mean, God owns all souls. He's our creator. But it's highly important when we're dealing with people to know how to deal with them correctly. This world wants to deal with them in a certain way. Satan wants to deal with them in a certain way. Well, our Father wants to deal with them in a certain way. And he uses his chosen people, his uh, elect, to lead God and direct God's children to his truth and the innermost, as we covered a couple weeks ago, the mysteries of God's word. It's not a mystery to God's elect. But it's a mystery to the world because they're blinded to the truth. Now, some say, well, I, know, I, I really don't need to go that deep. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that he died for my sins. And I believe he raised on, was raised on the third day and that he's alive today. That's all I need. Uh, for salvation, that's true. That's all you need. But if that's all our Father wanted you to know, this would be a very small book. It would just be practically just one chapter, if that. But there's so much more. Why? Because the world and how it behaves and the way people behave is so much more. So our Father wants us to learn how to be able to cope 
and to overcome the things of this world, overcome the adversities of this world, overcome all the obstacles that Satan tries to throw our way. I mean, there's so many people just throwing obstacles. So Satan doesn't have to have all that much help to, to perform his work these days. People are believing in so many lies. So our Father wants us basically to be clothed in heaven. And to be clothed in heaven means you need to have the righteous acts of the saints. And if you don't have those works in your life, the righteousness, the good works of that God has given us to do, you'll be, as uh, Dr. Murray has once said, naked as a jaybird in the kingdom. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be eternally naked as a jaybird in the kingdom of God. I want to have the crown of glory. I want to have the flowing robes. You say, well, you want an awful lot. Yes, I want to be obedient to my Father. And by being obedient means that you are taking His Word, you are studying it, and then you are doing it. You are obeying His commandments. And when you, when you falter, when you come short, you repent of your sins, and then you get back and do things what's right. But you, is, we need to specify, though, that the desire that you have to do these deeper studies and to do these righteous acts is not dependent on getting those robes and crown, but we want to please our Father. That's the bottom line. No, you must do righteous acts to receive those robes. I understand it, but that's not like the end all and be all. We do those things oh, no. to please our Father. Correct, correct. But to look at the bigger picture, we want not only to achieve the kingdom, but we want to be in the kingdom as well dressed as possible. <laughs> because after all, you can't earn righteous acts right. in the kingdom. We earn those righteous acts now in the flesh bodies. So we want to do all we can now because then it will be too late. And that's what I'm talking about. So, now, there will be times we know in a Christian's life uh, that things will be bitter. And we know that we have studied that the more we know, the more this world will be against us. But also, the bitterness, as we, we covered a couple weeks ago, was the bitterness of knowing what's coming to, let's say, some of our loved ones that are being disobedient and who are not changing and who are faltering. It's bitter to us to see what lies before them because we know what their outcome will be without their repentance. So, uh, with that being said, we're going to continue in Revelation chapter 10, pick it up where we left off, with verse 10, with wisdom from our Heavenly Father. And I, this being of course John, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand. And again, uh, do you remember what, what this book was? Um, book of Life. Book of Life, but it's the Word of God, basically. Mm -hmm. And who, what angel, we're talking about the angel of God, who we're actually talking about who? Who is the only one worthy to open this book? Christ. Christ himself. So, understand this, beloved. Did God cram all his knowledge into John's head? No. He had to take the book. That is the word of God. He did what? And ate it up. In other words, he consumed the knowledge that was in the book. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, in other words, absorbed it, he studied it. My belly was bitter. Now, some again, some scholars feel that knowing the truth brings bitterness into your life. Well, I disagree. I think we bring much of the bitterness of life on ourselves by being disobedient to the Word of God. 
knowing better, and we keep turning from that. Paul, Paul even, go ahead. I'll say, couldn't the bitterness be that knowing what will happen to others if they don't? Yes, as I as okay. as we had just uh, talked about, yeah. that is part of bitterness. I said some of these scholars are saying that this bitterness is the bitterness of life that Christians go through. See, a lot of this bitterness people bring on themselves by being disobedient. They don't even know why some of these things are happening to them. They're ignorant of it. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't see the forest for the trees, so to speak. Now, I feel this bitterness is what we're going to witness, like I said earlier, in the near future of seeing would-be Christians wor worshiping a spurious Messiah, a false Messiah, Antichrist, if you would, who comes saying, I come to rapture you away, and the whole world, as it says in another place, the whole world will be whoring after him. Well, God's elect are in the world, but they're not of the world. They don't follow the things of the world. Things of the world are, are, are bitter to us. We don't like following the things that the world's doing. They can't count from one to seven, I guess. They're jumping on the bandwagon of the Antichrist at the sixth trump instead of the seventh trump. Verse 11. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, and nations, and tongues, and kings. Now we know John was on Patmos. He wasn't getting off Patmos. How is he going to do this again with all these people, nations, and tongues, and kings? You're reading it now. He has scribed this down for generations that would come after him. So in other words, tell people what you know of God's truth. Acts chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2 tells of the sons and daughters that would teach, that would prophesy before many peoples. That's what happened on Pentecost Day. They were all speaking in a tongue that every person could understand in their own language. I repeat, could understand with clarity. Now, this is important to understand. I know we, we covered this last couple of weeks, but I believe it's important that we go there. I want to go to Acts chapter 2 one more time. Acts chapter 2, and I want to go to verse 17. Remember, language was very important at this time in Jerusalem because you could, you could travel about 10 miles and run into about five different dialects. There were so many people. And uh, it, it was a problem at times. And all their people had gathered in from a hundred miles or more to this Pentecost day, and there were hundreds of different languages there. And when these spoke, even though they were Galileans, as we covered last week, they would be understood in every language, which is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Not something unknown. This is known, but something that was clearly identified. Verse 17, this is concerning verse 11 of chapter 10 of Revelation on how you would speak and prophesy. Why? Because it is written. Now listen to this. Acts chapter 2 verse 17 and it reads, And it shall come to pass in the last days. Now when is this going to happen? In the last days. That's why in chapter 10 we're reading about the last trump in the book of Revelation. So that you know that these two really are an overlay of one another. In other words, they take place at the same time saith God. Now, who's saying this? It's not coming from man. It's not coming from Paul. It's not coming from John. It's coming from your Father. I, being our Father, will pour out my Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. 
and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Now, it does say all flesh, but does that really mean all peoples of the world? All peoples of the world will be able to prophesy? Well, why would God give his beautiful information from the Holy Spirit to those that don't love him, those that don't even believe in him? This, was all, this is supposed to be to the men of Jerusalem, I believe. That's right. Well, not just Jerusalem. We're talking about the last days. Mm -hmm. Not just Jerusalem. We're talking about the last days, so what's are... happening from God, by His Holy Spirit, to those that are basically following Him. Okay? Believing in Him. I'm saying, but trusting in on Him. On Pentecost, it was to the men of Jerusalem. During the actual Pentecost day, it was to the Galileans that were in Jerusalem. Right. But this is going beyond that day. This is going to, what did it say? The last days. That's why it specifies that. Okay. We're going to what would be their future. What would even be our present at this time. Because there are people prophesying. Which means what? They're teaching. Teaching what? Of God's future events. That's what prophesy prophecy is. It's teaching the truth, but it's teaching truth of future events that's going to take place. And it says here, not maybe, but it's going to happen. And I must caution you, though, this is exactly where a lot of would-be Christians take from uh, placing in their own minds thoughts of prophecy and visions saying that their thoughts and their visions are coming from God when they are not coming from God. So, a person may say, well, who do I believe then? Beloved, if you cannot find what's being given you in the Word of God, don't believe that it comes from God. Because our Father has told us in His Word, I have foretold you all things. That means in my Word, I have given you all things that you need to be ready for the end days, to be ready to battle Satan and his dominion. See, there are a lot of people who say all kinds of things about God today, but you can't find it in the Word of God. Why? Because it doesn't come from God. Think about it. Why would God, in these last days, give you something different, something new, that he's never talked about? Why would all of a sudden at the end time change things up? That is the author of confusion. See, Satan doesn't want you to know and understand the Word of God, so he'll th throw out some new stuff at you or through someone else. Well, God, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. All this is the, the book of Acts, the book of Revelation. All this has been spoken of before in the Word of God. This is just to repeat. The, the book of Revelation really is repeating of what has already been studied before, just like of Acts here. is the same thing as, as in Revelation in, in Revelation 10. Also in Revelation 9, you know, of certain things. So Father's not going to give us anything new now. So if you question what you're, what you're hearing, go look in the Word of God. See if you can find it. Utilize the tools that I've given everyone to use, such as take a word and uh, out of that sentence that they give you, or they say it's a verse, take it to your Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, look up that word, look up the meaning, find out wherever it's written in the Word of God, and then read those verses. And if those verses do not uh, relate to what the person is saying, don't believe them because it's not coming from your father. It's coming from the author of confusion. And God is not the author of confusion. And you should know who causes that confusion now. Okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 18. And on my servants, don't overlook that, not Satan's, not deceived ones, but on God's servants and on my servants, and on, on my handmaidens, female as well, 
I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they, that means all of them that, I, that he chooses, they shall prophesy. How? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be speaking through them. And remember how that Holy Spirit speaks. There's no doubt in the language. You don't need an interpreter. It's not an unknown tongue. It's plainly understood on every language on this planet. 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Do you see, do you see signs today? Mm -hmm. It's all over us. They're calling it global warming. People need to get their head out of the sand. Things are happening on this earth because this earth is showing us how close we are to the end times. And all you have to do is open your eyes to see it. And signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Remember back in Revelation 9, we, we, we covered this. Those th three things that we learned if not, go back and study Revelation chapter nine. It's very clear the time we would, uh, the time we would come forth. Beloved, don't overlook God's signs. He's showing us even on this earth how close, closer and closer we are getting to the end. It's all around you. Twenty. The sun shall be turned into darkness, right from Revelation chapter 9, and the moon into blood before, don't overlook this word, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. What is the day of the Lord? Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3 verse 8, it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. What, what's a thousand years? Millennium. <coughs> it's a millennium. So the entire millennium, the, the thousand year period, is the great day of the Lord. It's a thousand year period. But all this that we're covering here is happening before that thousand-year period begins. Now, why the millennium? Why has our Father set a thousand years, one day with Him, but to us a thousand years? Why is He setting that aside for His children? What's the point of the millennial period? It's a time of teaching times that those that have not had an opportunity to understand or learn God's truth have an opportunity at that point of time to learn it and to make a choice whom they're going to stand with. Well, don't stand. they have that now? They do, but they have free will and they most times choose not to do that. They choose to do their own thing, which is not usually a okay, You say free will. Are you saying during the millennial period there won't be no, free will? No, they will have free will, but they will also have knowledge of God's Word. So the difference between the thousand year period and now, now we're in flesh. Mm -hmm. We have all these doubts and all these concerns and all these worries and all this negative, negative, negative stuff that can come upon us very easily. And all the falsehoods. And all the falsehoods. However, during the millennium, first thing, Satan and all his confusion and all his doubts and worries and frustrations is going to be locked away. There's not going to be no negatives during that thousand year period. Also, we aren't in flesh bodies anymore during that right. thousand years. Everybody is in a spiritual body. Not their eternal body body yet. Only those in the eternal body at that point will be God's elect because he knows that he can count on them for what they have done already. But all the others, all the millions upon billions of other souls that 
have doubt, have worry, have frustrations, are now in a spiritual body, and their minds are so clear, it's not muddled with anything of the flesh, now the truth can come to them without any obstruction. And that truth will come directly from our Father. There won't be no denominational teaching. There won't be other kind of theologies. There's only going to be one Lord, one God, one faith, and one baptism, and one God and Father of all. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to accept, as we know by the end of the book of Revelation. There will still be, at the end of that thousand-year period, Satan will be loosed for a short season. And that's to test those who have just gone through the thousand years, and that's all they've heard was truth, but they still haven't been tested with that truth. So Satan will be loosed at the end of that thousand year period to see how many will still leave God and leave his truth and leave his word. And then at that point will be the lake of fire. At that point will be the great white throne judgment. And if those that have gone through the thousand year period fail and choose to hate God and turn from him, our Father does not want those people in eternity. Why? Because all they're going to do is cause problems after problems after problems, just like they do today. So they will be blotted out from existence at that point. That's called the great uh, hell fire. But basically, they're not burning, as some people teach, as a piece of bacon for all eternity. What kind of heaven do you live in by looking down at, let's say, Billy Joe Bob down there and and you're looking at him burn for all eternity. No, they're blotted out from existence. That means you don't even have a thought that they ever even existed. They're gone and gone forever. And all we have left, there's no tears. There's no crying. There's no mourning. There's no hurt. There's no feeling of, of worry or frustration or even regret. We're all on the same level with God, worshiping him honoring him, loving him, and he us. What a time it's going to be. But, in the meantime, this is what we're striving for. This is our brass ring that we're reaching for. And this is what the millennial period is for, to teach those. It's not a second chance, because these people that we're talking about never had a prayer of a chance, because they had been they accepted lies. They've been duped. And, 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 they've, and they, they've turned from our Father left and right. And the bottom line is, is who are you listening to today? Are you listening to man and his teachings? Or are, list, are you listening to God and his? And that's what it comes down to. And in verse 21 it says, And it shall come to pass, not, not maybe, this is going to happen, it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, what does that mean? You call upon the name of the Lord, you're going to be saved. That's what it means. But you've got to understand, how many people actually call on the Lord? Have you called on the Lord lately? Or you just wait till something, something tragic happens before you call on Him? Have you thanked Him today? For, you say, for what? for your very being, for your heartbeat, for, for, for all the loving things that he has brought forth in your life. Some, some say, well, I don't have very much things to be thankful for. Then you don't have eyes to see nor ears to hear. And the fact is, there's, there's a, we can be thankful no matter what condition we're in. Now, I saw a guy the other day... Um, uh, singing on on the television, and I just saw his his bust, you know, the, his head part, and he's a he's a good singer, he's singing Christian songs, and then they they pan back and they showed him he was a paraplegic. He was he was in that he did, wasn't born that way. It was because of tra tragedy in his life, but he didn't blame God. As a matter of fact, he loved God, and he still loves God. And the fact is, there can be all kinds of tragedies in your life. But you have got to come to realize that our Father has a better plan for you. And that plan, if you're not there now, can start today. 
All you have to do is believe and trust in him and give credit where credit is due. That is what Joel the prophet taught us in the book of Joel, if you want to know what was really said on Pentecost Day. For those that think that it was unknown, there, it's, there's nothing unknown about it. It was made very clear in the second chapter of the book of Joel. But, okay, there you have it, documented. Okay, with that said, let's go back to the book of Revelation, beginning with chapter 11. Learning of the two, we're going to be getting into, not today, but learning of the two witnesses and the temple as far as the men, the temple basically is the many-membered body of Christ, all his set-aside ones. Revelation, meaning the uncovering, chapter 11, verse 1, and it reads, And there was given me a reed, like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. That looks like a pretty big place, doesn't it? Now, the word rod here really is not for measuring. Because it, uh, it's a rod for correction, really a rod for destruction. Check it out for yourself in the Greek dictionary. You'd be glad you did. The prime word itself means to beat. In other words, God's unhappy at this point. Why wouldn't he be? The sixth trump had sounded. Uh, in the 13th verse of that chapter, and Antichrist appeared in Jerusalem, claiming that he's God in the holy place, why wouldn't it be for a rod of destruction, a rod for correction? This really comes from the Old Testament in Lamentations, that sad song. And I do want to make one more turn here before we end. It's the second chapter of Lamentations. Please turn there if you would. Lamentations chapter 2. It's right after Jeremiah, after Isaiah, after Proverbs and, and Psalms and all that. you got Lamentations. This is to show you the book of Revelation really is not a new thing. It's just a revealing and un uncovering of what has already been taught us. It's simply a recap of the entire Bible. And this was foretold of in that sad song. That's what Lamentations was, a sad song. In the types, God sets forth types. That's why it is so easy to understand our Father's Word. Okay, we're there. Lamentations chapter 2. Now I want to pick it up with verse 7. The Lord hath cast off his altar. Hey, he doesn't want anything to do with his altar in that condition. Well, what condition? Remember, the Antichrist is sitting in his altar. And he, so he doesn't want anything to do with his altar. He hath abhorred his sanctuary. Why wouldn't he? Was Satan sitting right in it, claiming that he's God? Why wouldn't he abhor his sanctuary? See, this is talking about the end days. He hath given up into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. Bear in mind, he gave it to Satan. He allowed this to happen. Why? That's what the people wanted. You see, this is what our Father has always done for his children. He's given them what they really wanted. And that's what people want today. They want a false God. They want a God that they can manipulate or think that they can manipulate. They want a God that... The, that they can do whatever the heck they want to do, when they want to do it, and how they want to do it. 
And that's exactly what Satan's given to them. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord as in the day of a solemn, uh, solemn feast. This looks like there's a religious celebration going on, doesn't it? But there's one big problem with it. Oh, they're hooping and they're hollering, but it's not for God. They're not worshiping God. They're worshiping the Antichrist here. Claiming that he's God. Thinking that he's God. Calling them Jesus. Calling them Christ. And they're making a big noise all over the world. The only ones that aren't making a noise at this time are God's elect because we know the truth. We know who's sitting in there first before the true Christ returns. But it's an abomination to our Father. He abhors it. Uh, the Antichrist comes in and says, I've come to rapture you away. And they jump on that bandwagon and say, let's go. Verse 8. The Lord hath proposed to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. That's what the reed and that's what the rod is for. We're talking about in Revelation chapter 11. He has stretched out a line. He hath not withdrawn his hand from destroying. It's not going to change his mind. Why? Because they're not going to repent. Therefore, he made the rampart, that's leading up to the wall, made the rampart and the wall to lament. They languish together. Bear in mind, this shouldn't be much of a shock to you. The Gospels document this. I mean, what did Christ say in Matthew 24 and, and, or, uh, Matthew 24 and Mark 13? about the condition of these beautiful buildings. Remember the uh, apostles came to him and said, look at these beautiful buildings, how wonderful, ma majestic they are. Mm -hmm. Not one stone will be left standing. Right. He said there's coming a day. Not one stone will be left standing on top of another. Why? Because of that rod, that, that uh, rod of destruction. It will destroy all. Why? Because the abomination that would be standing in that within those walls. And Christ says, I'm going to flatten this place. That's what the rod is for. All right, I'll, you I'll do eight. Huh? You were doing eight. Yeah, let me do one more verse. We'll end here. Her gates are sunk into the ground. He hath destroyed and broken her bars. Her king, notice the lowercase k, her king and her princes, what are princes? You remember what princes are? Yeah. Princes are basically rulers, those that are following the king, not our king. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. This word Gentiles should be translated nations. The king here is not our king. You'll know again by the lowercase k in king. It's the fake king. It's the devil. It's Satan. It's Lucifer. It's the little horn. It's the false prophet. Whichever name you choose to give him, because each name means a different time frame where he's where he's coming from, where his actions are. The, hear this. The law is no more. What law? God's law. You say, well, wait a minute. God's law will never fail. It will never fail to God's elect, but it will fail to those who turn from God's law. They don't want any part of it. Do you think the Antichrist is going to come claiming that he's Jesus sitting in the temple and follow all the word of God? Of course not. Well, he's going to tell them he wants them to be happy. He's going to tell them and give them exactly mm -hmm. what they think happiness is. Mm -hmm. Which is what? Wealth. Uh, homosexuality. Living however you want to live. 
you know, you can you can do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. I'm here to please you. I'm your God, and I, I love you, and I'm going to give you what you want. That's exactly some of the things he's going to be giving them. And they're going to take it hook, line, and sinker. Think about the world today, how they're behaving and how they think. And if they had some kind of spiritual entity right now show up and give them what they want, spiritually speaking, how many you think will jump on that bandwagon? The whole world. The whole world. The only ones that will not jump on that bandwagon are God's elect. Because we know the truth. The law is no more. That's God's word. His truth. It's not being spoken then. It's not being spoken now in many cases. Her prophets, not God's, her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. How in the world are they going to find vision from the Lord when they're not turning to the Lord? They're turning to the Antichrist. They're not going to be getting visions from God. They're going to be getting visions from the anti-God. There will be many that come with deception, claiming that they are of Christ when they are not of Christ. Be prepared, beloved. You don't think this prophecy hasn't already come to pass? Well, it, let me ask you this. Is God's laws taught today? Some say yes. Some say no. Let me ask you in a different way. Are all of God's laws being taught today? No. How can you say that? <laughs> Let's see. Anything that's an abomination to him, which I could go and name several things, are basically running amok in the world today. That's abortion, homosexuality, pedophiles. You know, adultery. Adultery. Idolatry. idolatry. Mm -hmm. So no, his laws aren't being taught. because, And the people wouldn't follow them. Most of the people wouldn't follow them even if they were taught on a regular basis. Because of the way the human nature is these days. Would you say that um, God's Sabbath is a law? Yes. Is it being followed? No. In most cases? People think it is. They feel that it's Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. Why? How can we document that it's not Sunday? By God's Word. See... When was sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, which was the original Sabbath? It's usually Friday. When was evening. that changed? When was it changed? The Council of Nicaea. Council of Nicaea changed it in the year 325 A.D., give or take a few years. Not only was the Sabbath changed, so was Passover. People no longer follow Passover, very few. They, they follow Ishtar, or what they call Easter. There's all kinds of things that have been changed. And now, what's the saying? If you say a lie long enough, you tend to believe it as a truth. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening today. People have been lied to over and over and over and over again so long that they now believe it. But it's an abomination to our Father. The only thing that we can believe and trust in, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is the Word of God. He has given us His Word for a reason. He had all these books, 66 of them, actually more books than that. A lot of books have been dropped, different subject for a different time. You can look that up for yourself. It's called the Apocrypha, that some of those books had been taken from the King James but even before the King James, before the, even the King James was formed, our Father had his word scribed on scrolls by his appointed ones, by his prophets, by his, his followers, and they scribed it down as our Father spoke to them through his spirit. And it was written down for a specific reason for you. 
for you today so that you can receive the fullness that our Father wants you to have. He wants you to have this knowledge. But you got to do something, just as John did. You have got to go and take it. You've got to go and take the book, meaning you've got to take the knowledge from this book and you've got to study it to show thyself approved unto God. You've got to study it and chew it. Now some people say, well, I, I, I try to do that and I, I just don't understand it. What would you tell them to do? You would say, first of all, pray for, the, for God to send his Holy Spirit to you to lead God and direct you. That's why we always pray before mm -hmm. we study. Because it is not my words. It is our Father's words. It is His Holy Spirit that speaks through us. And then again, search for someone who's teaching Bible, you know, directly from the Bible. You know, chapter who, by chapter, verse by verse. Who is by chosen by God mm -hmm. to teach the Word of God. There's a lot of people telling about the Word of God. Yes, but chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Chapter by it. chapter. Why is it so important to study the Word of God Chapter by chapter and verse by verse, line by line, precept by precept. Because Why is it important to study it Because that man can take anything out of that Bible and make it mean what he wants it to mean. That's why you have so many people today that will jump from one book to another book to another book to another book and give you maybe five different verses. But the subject and the object and the article of what they're saying doesn't jive when they're jumping around all over the place. Our Father didn't write it that way, or had it written that way. See, we if we don't understand something, we need to go, as the Word says, to the author and finisher of our faith. That's Him. We need to go to Him and say, Lord, it's here. I know it's real. I know it's true, but I don't understand it. Enlighten me. Fill me. Now, He may lead you on a month study. Of that one verse. It's possible. He may, if you take that Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and check every, every verse in the Bible where that one word you're looking at is represented in the Word of God, believe me, it will open up an, a plethora of information to you. Just great amounts of information to you so that you'll be able to now Bring it together of exactly what our Father is talking about. And that is studying to show thyself approved. Now, I know what some people say. I don't have the time for that. That's your decision. That's your decision. Because let me tell you something. You need to make the time. I don't care if it means getting up earlier. I don't care if it means not eating lunch that day, or I don't care if it means staying up an extra hour. Let me tell you something. If you take one verse, even one word that you don't understand, and you study it and study it, and, study, and if it takes you as much time as it does, that will mean more to your father than you sitting down and reading a chapter a day and not receiving the fullness of what our father wants you to receive. Because let me tell you something, once you start receiving the fullness of God's Word, you can go out here in the highways and byways, and I don't care what comes up against you, you, in the name of Jesus, will have power and authority to overcome all the enemy. All the obstacles in life, you will be able to overcome. Why? Because you are doing it God's way and not your own way. And that means everything to our Father. All right, today we'll, we'll stop here and continue next week. Right now we're kind of in a transition period. We don't have all the uh, people that normally uh, do our uh, Bible studies with us. Uh, this is a, a different day set aside, and it's just for myself and my wife and you on YouTube. But all those that do study with us will be receiving this YouTube video just as you all are at the same time. So once we get back together, we'll still be on the same page, so to speak, with our studies. Are there any questions? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of this day. 
We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And I pray for everyone here today and all their families and all those on YouTube that you lead, guide, direct, touch, Father, that you are very important to us and we want to study thy word and absorb thy word as you have given us by thy Holy Spirit. And we thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for the blessings and we thank you for the love. For we do love you with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strengths, and with all our souls. For it is in Yahshua's precious holy name we pray. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.